How's it going, everybody? I'm Stella Chung, and this is The Weekly Fix, the show where we round up all the gaming and entertainment headlines you may have missed this week. Grand Theft Auto 6 is finally here, and it's real. We've got everything you need to know about the trailer. It's uber successful announcements that spawn dozens of copycats, what major platform the game is not coming to at release, and why the visuals in the trailer look so good. But GTA 6 isn't everything this week, how Sony is pulling content from users, the Fallout TV show that I'm so excited about, and much more. Let's get to the news. Now, Rockstar Games is notorious for making visually stunning games, which are revealed with slick cinematic trailers. And on Monday night, GTA 6 joined the company's long list of graphically impressive titles. And looking at the hair physics, the amount of jiggle watts in the BBL showed in Grand Theft Auto 6, well, the entire internet is not only watching, but talking about all there is for us to experience come 2025. Now, even former Rockstar animator Mike York gave his two cents on the trailer. And coming from a former employee who worked on both GTA 5 and RDR 2, his opinions come with a little more weight. Check it out. When you play this game, it's really gonna look like this. It's gonna look just like this. It's gonna be incredible. Cannot wait. Because the, the artists over there really know how to push the consoles and the the hardware to the limits with their level of detail their lod's and all their different stuff like this is just a normal character it looks like that's in the game an npc or whatever but look how realistic they look now a uh, slight correction mike there's a huge debate happening on the gta 6 subreddit right now on who that supposed npc is and a lot of fans are speculating that it might be main protagonist lucia but other than that he's right the NPCs in the game look extremely high poly, complete with body physics, usually reserved for the main characters in games of this nature. Now, NPCs are typically low poly in these massive sandbox games to cut corners on rendering, but it looks like Rockstar's artists and engineers are sparing absolutely no expenses and pushing the consoles to their very limits to bring us probably one of the most realistic looking games on this scale to date. But not only that, the amount of body types we see in that trailer alone is very promising. The rock star must have, I don't know, they must have been studying Florida's famous nightclubs and strip clubs to get the detailing just right on the impressive jiggle physics showcase in the GTA 6 trailer. Now, my jaw literally dropped and I probably replayed a couple of portions of that trailer numerous times for research purposes only. That's my excuse. What's yours? Now, I work at a games media company, so I'm allowed to zoom in on certain portions of the GTA 6 trailer during work hours to properly describe the twerking mechanics to all the cultured individuals in our audience. And you're welcome. And for even more stories on booty, I've got some bummer news for Fortnite players. Solid Snake is apparently missing his bottom. Look, it's no longer there. Now, I've never noticed Snake's backside, but others across the internet have pointed out how his once prominent tactical espionage ass has been shrinking ever since he graced the combat stages of Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. And now Snake's Fortnite skin has done the very same. Now, one concerned fan tweeted this out. Otacon. They took my ass. I can't sh So if you're hoping to clap some snake cheeks in a battle royale against the Metal Gear Pro Tag, your chances might be slim. Like there's no way for you to have your cake and eat it too. There's no candles to blow out. Epic Games decided not to blow snakes back out. Pause. Now Fortnite might have given fans a bum deal, but you can bet your bottom dollar Cyberpunk 2077 is all about turning the other cheek. Now the latest 2.1 update has added romantic hangouts. Now in one of these, if you check your character out in a mirror, your partner might approach you and give your butt a little slap. It's nice to see so much booty acknowledgement in games these days, isn't it? The PC gamers are swinging fists at the air over Rockstar, providing no word on when GTA 6 is expected to release on PC. And we've got confirmation that it'll hit the Xbox Series consoles as well as PlayStation 5 sometime in 2025. But the fact that we won't see a PC release day and date with consoles should come as no surprise, as that hasn't really been Rockstar's MO in the past. Plus, the modding community on PC is freaking insane, so it's likely Rockstar would want to hold off on a PC release release for a while to, you know, give the game some breathing room on consoles. Now, to give you an idea of how much breathing room Rockstar has provided in the past, 
GTA 5 was released on the PS3 and Xbox 360 in 2013, then finally found its way on PC two years later in 2015. Now, it was definitely a shorter release window for Red Dead Redemption 2 as it hit PC just a year after releasing on consoles in 2018. But PC gamers will undoubtedly get to enjoy the crazy world of Leonida and take it back to Vice City sometime in the future. I gotta say, I feel very uncomfortable with this image next to me. It's like they're trying to rob me. Please, I don't have any money, Lucia. Jason, what, you want a buck? Anyways, while we did in fact enjoy Christmas coming early in the form of the GTA 6 trailer dropping sooner than anticipated, some of the game devs at Rockstar aren't too happy with how it all went down. Now, less than 24 hours before its YouTube premiere, the trailer was leaked by some dunderhead who wanted to promote some freaking stupid Bitcoin. I think he was just promoting Bitcoin in general. So dumb. Now, while many of us online speculated that it might be fake, it was soon revealed to be real when Rockstar posted this tweet simply saying, our trailer was leaked, so please watch the real thing on YouTube. There was no enthusiasm in that tweet. Now, this was then followed by a few Rockstar employees tweeting how upset they were about the situation. Even others in the game community shared their thoughts on the whole leak situation. Josh Stein from Xbox said on Twitter, quote, Teams work literally hours, days, weeks, nights to build the best rollout to capture the attention of social media and go loud and proud for the community. Leaks utterly ruin that and waste a ton of work and also risk flat spinning your whole marketing message. Now, true statements, but the fans are usually just eager to see and hear information about their beloved franchises. So even if it is upsetting to those who work tirelessly on the project, at least there's a very strong fan base of supporters willing to keep that momentum going, despite some freaking dummy choosing the bad ending by leaking the content. The Grand Theft Auto series continues to heavily influence the industry, as many have been quick to parody the colorful teaser template Rockstar used last week to announce the date and time for the first trailer for Grand Theft Auto 6. Specifically, game developers have hopped on the trend, posting images using the same sunset colors to announce when to expect new information on a game they are working on. 343 Industries was among the first to parody the template, borrowing the same vibrant color aesthetic to announce a new trailer for Halo Infinite coming today, December 4th. Sea of Thieves developer Rare also used the template to announce that new information will be available for its pirate-themed game on December 7th. While it did not specify what time exactly, given the Game Awards falls on this day, it may be one of the many announcements set to appear during the show. Studios under the Activision Blizzard umbrella were quick to strike while the iron was hot. The official Overwatch X account used the template to announce and tease the time and date for a trailer for Overwatch 2's eighth season. Raven Software took advantage of the trend to promote the launch of season one for Call of Duty Warzone. Mediatonic, the studio behind Fall Guys, replicated the template as well to tease info on a new trailer, along with the date and time for when it will be publicly available. We're merely scratching the surface though, as developers are not the only ones using the template. For example, Walmart Canada Gaming's X account used the template to remind everyone that its retail chain sells games 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Not to mention, gamers and fans of other franchises have taken it upon themselves to parody the GTA 6 teaser trailer image. One user on the Manhunt subreddit, for example, made a Manhunt 3 poster teaser inspired by the GTA 6 aesthetics. Manhunt is also a Rockstar game. X users have also had a field day using the template to reshare news, such as Phil Spencer name dropping Banjo Kazooie in a recent interview, or confirmation that Destiny 2 The Final Shape was delayed to June 4th, 2024. Or one Assassin's Creed fan account that made one for the upcoming project, simply known as Codename Red. Moving on, Sony has signaled its intention to pull some PlayStation content, even from those who bought it, sparking concern from customers. In a brief notice on the PlayStation website, Sony said it planned to remove hundreds of Discovery films from users' video libraries, preventing them from watching the content they paid money for. Sony explained the decision as being due to content licensing arrangements with content providers. Here's the statement in full. As of the 31st of December, 2023, due to our content licensing arrangements with content providers, you will no longer be able to watch any of your previously purchased Discovery content, and the content will be removed from your video library. Library. We sincerely thank you for your continued support. Thank you, PlayStation Store. Yeah, you're welcome. There follows a long list of affected video content, which includes over a thousand seasons of shows, including Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman, Tanked, Mythbusters, and An Idiot Abroad. The decision has sparked a backlash and fueled concern around ownership of digital media. Video game preservation is a hot topic within the industry, but the issue of content removal from digital platforms is top of mind for movie and TV makers too. Last month, Oscar-winning filmmaker Guillermo del Toro backed Oppenheimer director Christopher Nolan in championing physical media amid controversial moves by streamers that have seen some films pulled from availability. 
availability. There's currently no way to back up purchased PlayStation Store video content from a PS4 or PS5. They cannot be transferred to a disc by any means. And it's different from the typical case with delisted video games, which remain available to play and download to those who own them. In its statement, Sony does not offer a refund or apologize for the decision. IGN has asked Sony for comment. What's that? Is that a class action lawsuit I smell? Speaking of massive open world games that players waited years for, Cyberpunk 2077 is getting another big update in patch 2.1 that adds in new content and even boss fixes. Just in time for the Ultimate Edition, patch 2.1 will arrive December 5th that will finally add the long requested Metro system. Yeah, I know, all those futuristic cars and bikes and you know what, some people just wanna take the subway. Players can travel between 19 Metro stations which can either be a fast travel point or be used like an actual Metro ride through the city. There are five Metro lines that can be found on their own map, but the system will only be accessible after the Compaqui Plaza sequence in the main storyline. The update is also allowing players to carry a radio around to listen to the in-game stations while walking around. The radio will turn itself off during dialogue or script music sequences. Not that I'm complaining, but there's something funny about this futuristic game getting extremely mundane 20th century features like a municipal transportation and an FM radio. CD Projekt Red also announced boss fight improvements in the update, including Adam Smasher. After Cyberpunk Edgerunners, the anime series released, players complained that his abilities in the game were much weaker and his fight was too easy compared to the menace he was actually meant to be. So now he's going to be a massive force to contend with. Car races will be playable too, and new vehicles will be added, including five motorcycles and Johnny Silverhand's original Porsche 911 that can be unlocked through a brand new quest. Motorcycle mechanics are also being upgraded so you can do tricks while riding them and you can use your throwing weapons while riding the bikes. And finally, there are more accessibility options being offered through a dedicated menu. More people being able to enjoy a game is always a plus, so good on CDPR. The official statement notes that this is not everything included in the update. I can't wait to see what they bring to 2.1. Every time I go back to play Cyberpunk, I always feel like I have to restart the game because of how many new things they add and it just changes the playstyle that I want to have. At a PlayStation Partner Awards event in Japan, Resident Evil 4 remake director Yasuhiro Anpo said the company has plans for more remakes and will announce them in due time. When asked if Capcom wants to keep making Resident Evil remakes, Anpo replied, yes. We've released three remakes so far and they have all been received very well. Since it allows a modern audience to play these games, it is something I am happy to do as someone that loves these older games and we want to continue doing more. What game we will remake in the future is something that we would like to announce in the future, so please look forward to it. To recap, Resident Evil 2, 3, and 4 have been remade, so it'll be interesting to see what Capcom will tackle next. The Resident Evil 4 remake had a couple of Easter eggs teasing a remake of 5, but a lot of fans really want Code Veronica. That one's definitely more in need of a modern overhaul since it launched in 2000 on Dreamcast. Anpo went on to say when developing a new game, there is no way to know what will be received well by the players, which makes it difficult. In the case of a remake, there are already players that have played the original, which I think can be seen as an advantage. We are very grateful to users that are vocal about their opinion. It allows us to develop with the player's opinion in mind. For example, if this is how the players feel, then maybe we can make it like this. I think this is one of the reasons why our remakes are so well received. Which Resident Evil would you want to see remade? Larian has released Baldur's Gate 3's hotly anticipated Patch 5, which adds loads of new content to the sprawling Dungeons and Dragons role-playing game. Patch 5 fixes slowdown issues caused by Patch 4, adds a brand new epilogue providing closure to each player's journey, and even new game modes. The new playable epilogue, accessible to all players loading the game prior to the final fight, takes place before the credits. Players find themselves in camp six months after the events of the story, where they quote, meet new friends and old, taking all the time they need to say their final goodbyes to the party. A statement reads, for the writers of Larian, this final goodbye has been some of the most most complex writing in the game so far, as it takes advantage of the game's reactivity across the entire adventure. A gigantic tree of permutations defines the content, with new writing, 3,589 lines to be exact, cinematics, and even characters joining the get-together at camp organized by Withers. Elsewhere, Patch 5 adds two new game modes, Honor and Custom modes. Honor mode makes the game more difficult in and out of combat and introduces over 30 new tweaks to all the game's boss fights. Now bosses can perform new actions, adding twists and turns to all major fights throughout the game, Larian said. Inspiration points become more valuable in honor mode as loading previous games or save scumming is disabled. Some of the more powerful unintended exploits have been removed for players who embark on an honor mode adventure, though have been kept open for players to exploit in other difficulty settings. When a player dies, they'll be presented with statistics of their journey, including how long and how far they survived. Should players choose 
choose, they can continue their adventure, which will then disable Honor Mode. Players who do manage to complete the entire game with Honor Mode enabled without dying will be awarded the coveted Golden D20. Custom Mode, on the other hand, lets players pick and choose the type of experience best for them. Options include the ability to hide the required roll to succeed dice checks, which gives a more realistic D&D experience, as well as the ability to hide enemy HP in battle. Other options include short rests, fully healing the party, disabling death saving throws, and hiding failed perception checks, which means you'll never know there was even a roll to begin with. Patch 5 also improves inventory access, letting players manage the inventory of all companions from one UI, regardless of whether or not they're currently in your party. Patch 5 weighs in at 30 gigs, but needs 130 gigs of free space to install. Larian suggested those without the space to install the update uninstall Baldur's Gate 3 and then re-download the patched version. Larian is set to announce Baldur's Gate 3's long-awaited Xbox release date at the Game Awards show next week on December 7th. Well, it looks like there's yet another reason to play Baldur's Gate 3 aside from the endgame cinematics. No spoilers, but it's super awesome. Before that happens, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're diving deep into everything you need to know about that Fallout TV show trailer, the Suicide Squad anime, and a whole lot more. Stay tuned. Welcome back. The Fallout TV show from Prime Video is causing quite a stir. While the show has yet to be officially recognized as a series canon from Bethesda, its creators are considering the upcoming show to be Fallout 5. But before we get deeper into that story, let's see what's up with that Suicide Squad anime. Take it away. Now we got the trailer for the Suicide Squad Isekai anime series set to release sometime next year. Now for those unfamiliar with this particular anime genre, Isekai essentially means another world, wherein protagonists from a modern day setting are transported to a fantasy world full of magic and mystical beings. Now for this one, it'll see Harley Quinn, Deadshot, Peacemaker, Clayface, and King Shark transported to a world presumably by Amanda Waller, tasked with taking out, I don't know, random creatures to level up their XP. I don't know, I have no clue if that's correct, but you never know. WB Japan hasn't released much information on the upcoming anime. All it's said so far is, quote, DC's Harley Quinn, the Joker, and the Suicide Squad rampage onto the stage of Isekai in the new original anime series from Warner Brothers Japan and Witch Studio. Suicide Squad Isekai, the most maddening worlds collide in an epic and violent fantasy with the strongest lineup of anime creators. Now, which studio is definitely filled with strong anime creators as it's the studio behind Ranking of Kings, Vinland Saga, and my personal favorite, Vivi Fluorite Eye Song. All anime you should definitely check out. Now, as for the Suicide Squad Isekai and where it falls in the overall DC universe, well, it's actually set outside of the main DC timeline, essentially existing in its very own universe. Now, the team is seemingly sent on another risky mission, presumably tasked with retrieving or executing executing something in this alternate reality. You know, Suicide Squad stuff. Now from the looks of the trailer, the Joker seems to be the culprit Task Force X is hunting down in this other world. You see the clown prince of crime making numerous remarks about traveling to another world, so maybe he took it upon himself to do just that. But it's a world full of all sorts of demons and mystical entities both the Joker and the Suicide Squad have little experience with. Maybe if you count Etrigan or Zatanna, I don't count them because, you know, anime is a whole other world and beast when it comes to demons and magic. And we'll see what happens in 2024 when the Suicide Squad Isekai premieres. The trailer for Prime Video's upcoming live action series based on the Fallout video games dropped this weekend, and it's full of familiar visuals, but it's also clearly exploring a new corner of that universe. So much so that the show's creators basically treated the project like they were making Fallout 5. During a roundtable discussion at CCXP, showrunner and executive producer Graham Wagner said, quote, we didn't start from a place of characters from the games. We set things after. We kind of told ourselves, this is Fallout 5. This is just another installation, and we're starting with fresh snow. While most of the Fallout games released this century have taken place along the eastern seaboard of the United States, the series will be set around post-apocalyptic Los Angeles, so there's plenty of ground, geographically and narratively, to cover without retreading any familiar territory. As role-playing games, Fallout stories vary wildly depending on player decisions. In an effort to explore the world from different perspectives, the show will focus on three characters from diverse backgrounds. Ella Purnell plays Vault Dweller Lucy, whose story sounds like it'll be pretty close to resembling a player's journey in the games. Meanwhile, Aaron Moten plays Maximus, a member of the Brotherhood of Steel, and Walton Goggins is playing a ghoul who's wandered around the wasteland for hundreds of years. Showrunner Jonathan Nolan explained further, saying, quote, having three perspectives, having Ella's character and Aaron's character and Walton's characters occupy these 
these very different corners of the Fallout universe gave us a chance to encompass some of the ambition of the games, not just in terms of world building, but in terms of morality and in terms of the gray area. We talked a lot about the good, the bad, and the ugly, which is one of my very favorite films, and so that was a great touchstone for us as we sort of embarked on the journey. End quote. As great as HBO's take on The Last of Us was, it did hit a lot of the same notes as the game, which it could do since that story is so linear. Fallout is the complete opposite, so I'm glad the show is taking a very different approach. As for when the actual Fallout 5 is happening in video game form, it may not actually be this decade. Bethesda Game Studios head Todd Howard said it's on the way after Elder Scrolls 6, but that won't be out until 2026 at the very soonest, according to FTC court documents. So here's hoping the Prime Video series gets enough right to hold Fallout fans over until then. Speaking of stuff that's not happening anytime soon, Marvel Studios head Kevin Feige says there are no plans to have Tony Stark slash Iron Man return to the MCU following the character's death in Avengers Endgame. Comic book deaths are not necessarily permanent and anything's possible thanks to the multiverse and also superhero movies being fictional, but Feige claims there are no plans to cheapen Robert Downey Jr.'s big send-off in Endgame. Speaking to Vanity Fair, Feige stated, quote, we're going to keep that moment and not touch that moment again. He said, we all worked very hard for many years to get that and we would never want to magically undo it in any way. The MCU is definitely in a state of flux right now and there have been some rumors that the original Avengers might get reassembled to try to drum up some end game level hype, but it doesn't sound like Feige's resorting to that quite yet. Elsewhere in the realm of comic book movies, Zack Snyder has acquired the rights to an unproduced 300 sequel that he wrote while at Warner Brothers. Titled Blood and Ashes, the film would focus on Alexander the Great, but obviously with Snyder's trademark stylized spin on the historical epic. Speaking to The Hollywood Reporter, the Justice League director explained, quote, we got the rights back so we can make it if we want it. I don't know what the marketplace is for an incredibly homoerotic, super violent, super sexual movie, but maybe it's perfect. Hey, you got my attention. There's no guarantee this will ever see the light of day or if it'll still be an official titled 300 spinoff, but who knows? Snyder's next epic is the two-part space opera Rebel Moon, part one of which hits Netflix very soon, premiering December 15th, so maybe if that's a hit, we'll get Blood and Ashes on Netflix or some other historical action. Snyder wasn't married to the 300 franchise being strictly swords and sandals either. In previous interviews, he talked about doing sequels set during the American Revolution or at the Alamo, both of which sound completely bonkers. What historical battle would you like to see a 300 movie about? Sound off in the comments below. I feel like the 30 Years War might be a good fit for a nice long five hour Snyder cut. Plus, the defenestrations of Prague are just asking to be shot in super slow Snyder vision. A shout out to Paramount for giving us our first look at Shadow in next year's Sonic the Hedgehog 3. Now this tweet from the movie's account shows us production is in full swing with Jeff Fowler at the helm and is planning on sticking to that December 20th, 2024 theater release. And in the photo, we see a Shadow stand-in sporting those famous kicks first seen in Sonic Adventure 2. Now, still no word on who will be voicing Sonic's artificially assembled antagonist, but it's safe to say that the movies have reached the adventure phase of the Sonic series. And 2024 is shaping up to be quite the year for Sonic, as we'll also be receiving the tie-in spin-off Knuckles series early next year. Now, the series will stream on Paramount+. Plus. Casting includes returning Sonic the Hedgehog 2's Idris Elba as the titular Echidna and Adam Pally, who you might remember was the bumbling Green Hills police officer, Wade Whipple. Now, Tika Sumter will also reprise her role from the movies, guest starring in a few episodes. Now, Back to the Future's very own Christopher Lloyd was recently added to the cast in an undisclosed role as well. But there have been leaks online that say Lloyd will be playing a character named Great Scott. Great Scott, that's a joke, of course, I'm kidding. Production on that series was well underway in London before the strikes, but no word or update has been given since. Now, one of the primary questions fans might have about the upcoming series is, what's it about and where does it fall in the overall timeline of the Sonic movies? Now, the official logline suggests it'll take place after the events of Sonic the Hedgehog 2 as a lead up to Sonic 3. And it also details that Knuckles agrees to train Officer Wade in the ancient ways of the Echidna, taking him under his wing as his protege. Now, how he plans to teach a bumbling cop how to be an Echidna warrior is beyond me, but with the comedic delivery both characters had in Sonic 2, this sounds like this series will lean more on the comedy side of things than high stakes action. Now, a while back, director Jeff Fowler teased this image of the slate, signaling production was underway for the upcoming series. 
Now that's all we have for now, but as we move into production post strikes, there'll surely be more information surfacing about both the Knuckles series and Sonic 3 movie. Now we'll keep you updated as more news breaks. As for now, drop your theories as to who you think the big baddie will be in the Knuckles series leading into the third Sonic movie. And speaking of Prime Video, it's giving us another The Boy spinoff. Now after the successful run of Gen V, fans of the graphic novel turned hit live action series can look forward to The Boys, Mexico. Yes, that's the actual name of the series, The Boys, Mexico. Yeah, it pretty much tells you everything you need to know about the series, right? Well, if that isn't enough information for you, there's not much else known apparently about the upcoming series other than it's being helmed by the writer of DC's Blue Beetle movie and being shot in Latin America. Now, no word on casting just yet, but we'll be sure to keep you posted on that. And if they think of a more creative name for the series than tacking on an entire country at the end of it. The Boys Mexico, seriously? I mean, I'm here for it. I, I just don't get what it could possibly mean or what it entails. Apparently it takes place in Mexico. That's all we know. There's gonna be soups in Mexico. Anyways, drop your thoughts on what it could possibly be about in the comments. I'm Stella Chung and that was your Weekly Fix. We'll be back here next Saturday with more of the biggest gaming and entertainment news. See you then.